Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs. And I'm very excited this morning to be co-presenting with two individuals today, Lynn Wright and Dottie Farr. So Lynn is a team leader with the Office of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. And Dottie Farr is with Farr Consulting. You may know Dottie's name from many trainings that DDAP currently offers, uh, including the motivational interviewing training. So we're really looking forward to having presenters today. And I'm going to stop for a second because our team is going to be recording this conversation. And so if you do not want to be recorded today, if you could please take a moment to, you can go ahead and step out of the call. And I want to reassure you that your, um, that this conversation Topic will be posted to the DDAP website at a later date. So again, if you're not comfortable, that is fine. And you can step out of the call and we will have this available at a later date on our DDAP website. Gosh, all the folks that are coming in still, it's it's happening here this morning and I really appreciate everybody joining us today. All right, moving on here. Yes, and somebody did ask, Lisa, thanks for pointing that out. And I'm going to I'm going to kind of cover that here. Um, yes, yeah, so you are muted and most people do not have the capability to um, show their camera. So um, most people are muted and they do not have the ability to show their camera to kind of avoid some technical um, issues that we might experience with those things. So um, you may have noticed that. And I just want to let you know that during this call today, will be looking at questions coming into the chat. So you can type a question into the chat and our team will take note of that question and we will respond to that question at a later date. We will not be providing responses to questions in real time in the chat or the presenters will not be um, providing responses to questions in real time. So please, um, if you have questions, don't hesitate, put those in the chat. Our team will take a note of it and we'll be sure to respond to you at a later date. The one thing I would ask if you do put a question in the chat is that if you can please put your email so that we know how to respond back to you, that would be most appreciated. So question in the chat and email attached to that, that would be wonderful. Um, also a reminder for future topics, um, we, we like to get questions um, from the field prior to the presentation. So we did get a couple of questions in on this topic. So we will be broadcasting those questions and the responses that we provided to those questions during the presentation today. So for future topics, if you are interested in the topic and you have a question, please submit that to the ACM email account, which is on the screen right here. Um, again, the call is being recorded. If you would like to leave now and if you're not comfortable being recorded, please do so and the call will be available at a later date. And we always love to get suggestions for future topics. So if you have any suggestions for future topics, you can type that in the chat, or you can also send it to the ACM email account, which again is on the screen in front of you. I think I got everything there. Okay, so I just want to take the opportunity, and I think for those of you who have attended these calls before, I really try to stress this. Um, these trainings are a resource for providers and for payers and other stakeholders not replace the need to um, read the ACM criteria 2013 text in its entirety. And I know it's a big, it's a big read there, but it to read that text to understand the spirit of the ACM criteria um, and to also attend the ACM training that are available. Um, and so I just want to again reiterate the importance of um, making sure people read the ACM text and attend these trainings to understand the ACM. I know it's 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 pretty it's uh, tempting to kind of go into that specific level of care that you may provide, but really we understand ACM better in the whole context of the text. Um, and I also just want to take this opportunity, speaking of trainings, to put in a specific plug for um, a co-occurring disorders training that is currently being offered by Dottie Farr, who is one of our co-presenters, and Kate Chichester, who I believe is also on this call today. Um, the official name of this training is Co-Occurring Conditions, Promising Practices, and Approaches. And this training is available to SCAs to request from DDAP. Um, and DDAP is also excited to be hosting this training at some point in the near future. So be sure to be checking the ACM training email accounts and, or I'm sorry, the ACM training website and also be keeping an eye out on the listserv because we will be sending an announcement when that training does become available. 
Um, other ACM related trainings are obviously on the ACM transition section of the DDAP website. All right, so now we're going to get into the learning objectives. Um, so today we're really going to be focusing on um, a specific section of the ASAM text. So if you actually have your ASAM book, and I'm sure many of you do, I would actually encourage you to pull that out today as we're going through this presentation um, so that you can follow along. We are really going to be focusing heavily on pages 22 to, 20, 22 to 30 of the ASAM text. And we're going to be going through piece by piece what exactly it means to be a co-occurring capable program. Um, we are going to really be trying to assist providers in recognizing that co-occurring mental health conditions and SUD conditions are really something that we should expect. So it's no longer the exception. It is something that we really should expect at this point in all settings of care. We're also going to point out specific parts of the text that are going to be helpful for providers understanding what co-occurring capability is. Like I said, if you have your ACM text, if you can pull that out so you can follow along with us, I think that would be really helpful. And then on most slides, you are going to be seeing a reference um, so you'll know which specific page numbers we are talking about. So trying to make it as easy as possible for you. And Danny, I see that you're raising your hand. If you wouldn't mind actually typing your question in the chat box, we would be more than happy. If it's kind of a technical issue that you're experiencing, we'd be happy to assist you with that live. Um, if it's a question related to co-occurring capability, you can also type that later date. And the lastly, we're going to be clarifying um, that co-occurring capability is something that, that programs can achieve within existing program resources. So we want to make sure that folks know that it's not this huge shift that needs to take place in terms of hiring, you know, a handful of additional staff or anything like that. It's really something that can be achieved within existing program resources. And so we're going to be talking more about that today. And we realize, um, like many topics that we go through on these calls, this may bring up a lot of questions for you and a lot of uncertainty. Um, and we really encourage you to kind of put those questions and maybe those issues that you're struggling with related to this topic in the chat so that we can help provide technical assistance and answer your question at a later date. All right, so we are going to start today by reviewing some key definitions and terms related to this topic of co-occurring capability. And I'm going to start by looking at one very common term. So this co-occurring conditions term, um, and then we're going to kind of look at this uh, in the context of the co-occurring disorders term. Um, so I want to look at the co-occurring conditions term because we really have to understand this term in order to understand co-occurring capability, which is what our presentation is obviously about today. Um, so I'm going to start with this more common term, co-occurring disorders. So this co-occurring disorders was formerly kind of uh, mentioned or discussed as dual disorders or dual diagnosis or comorbid disorders. I'm sure there's many other terms here that I'm forgetting. Um, and it was used to, or it is used to kind of describe an individual who has a concurrent mental health disorder and a substance disorder. So in a co-occurring disorder, at least one disorder of each type, so one of mental health and one of substance use disorders, can be established independent of the other. And uh, it is not a cluster of symptoms resulting from a single disorder. So I just want to clarify that use of the co-occurring disorders term, um, it, it no way is an implication as to which disorder is primary and which disorder is secondary. So we really, we really want to kind of hone in or drive home that it doesn't really matter for this for this definition. What matters is that both conditions are present. They both need to be treated with the same intensity concurrently. Um, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, Kate and Dottie have a really, really nice training on co-occurring disorders that dives much deeper into this topic. So then taking a look at the less, I think, in my opinion, the less common uh, term co-occurring conditions, this is a term that really refers to individuals who have concurrent substance use and addictive behaviors, um, but there may not be enough information available to make a formal diagnosis. So somebody presents in front of us, they have a lot of symptoms of what might look like a certain mental health disorder, but we're not quite ready to make that formal diagnosis. And the same thing for substance use as well. So we may have in a mental health setting, somebody presents with what looks like maybe a, a substance use disorder, but we're not quite sure if we can make that formal diagnosis yet. 
So this co-occurring definition or co-occurring conditions term, what this really speaks to is the idea that even if there's not a formal diagnosis, we should begin to provide interventions for whatever we're seeing, for the set of symptoms that we're seeing. And obviously we need to screen and we need to assess properly to better understand what's going on here. But basically this co-occurring conditions term is a set of symptoms for substance use and mental health disorders that are occurring at the same time, but we may not have a formal diagnosis for either the substance use disorder or the addictive uh, behavior or the mental health condition. Um, so I think it's important to draw attention to this term co-occurring condition because it really highlights the importance of assessing for these co-occurring conditions so that we can, again, begin to provide prevention. So we don't ignore what we're seeing. We don't ignore these symptoms. We are able to start to really treat these, what we see is going on here. Um, and we are able to screen for mental health issues and we know what interventions we should probably start with. This is why understanding co-occurring capability is so important, and I'm going to turn it over to Dottie, who is going to provide a much more in-depth exploration of this term of co-occurring capability. Thanks, Kathleen. So when we're talking about co-occurring capable programs, we're looking at treatment programs that are going to address mental health and substance use disorders in all of their policies and procedures, their assessments, their treatment planning processes, their program content, and in their discharge planning. They'll have arrangements in place for coordination and collaboration between addiction and mental health services. Co-occurring capable programs can provide medication monitoring at any and all levels of care. They will provide addiction and psychological assessment and consultation either on site or through coordinated consultation with off-site providers. Staff are able to address the interactions between mental and substance use disorders and their effect on a person's readiness for change, as well as relapse and recovery environment issues. And you're gonna do this both through individual and group modalities in our programs. Addiction treatment settings that are co-occurring capable focus on their primary focus is on the, on the treatment of addiction, while within the mental health setting, a co-occurring capable program's primary focus is on the treatment of the mental health disorder. Recovery-oriented co-occurring capable involves integrating at every level the concept that the next person, quote, coming in the door, is going to likely have co-occurring conditions and needs. They may or may not meet the threshold of a diagnosis in DSM. The approach emphasizes that people need to be welcomed for care, engaged with empathy and the hope of recovery, and provided with what they need in a person-specific and integrated fashion. I can't stress enough the importance of recovery-oriented co-occurring capability requiring that all care is welcoming and person-centered. Each and every person must be screened, assessed, and referred if necessary for treatment of any co-occurring disorder. This version of the ACM criteria seeks to de-emphasize the notion of placement and it responds to advances in our practice field and our public policy including the Affordable Care Act. So while the ACM criteria is designed to be as objective, measurable, and quantifiable as possible, you must realize that certain aspects of these criteria require subjective interpretation. So the principles, concepts, and criteria of this text promote good stewardship of resources that allow people to receive all the care they need for their co-occurring conditions. Next slide, Kathleen. So regardless of the level of care that you have identified, recommendations for staffing components are made within the text. In the complexity of the team composition, increases with the complexity of the issues that are being presented by the individual seeking treatment. There are some common misconceptions that in order to be co-occurring capable, 
I'm going to have to hire a psychiatrist or I'm going to have to have a full time mental health counselor on board or my mental health program has to hire substance use clinicians. And that's not reality. Um, Co-occurring capability is achievable with the resources that are already on hand. And there are really clear standards in the text, in every level of care, in the staffing section that would describe um, the supporting services that must be there. The criteria do require that if a Dimension 3 issue is present, the person must be referred to a co-occurring capable or enhanced facility. Level 1 staffing expectations, for example, can be found in your textbook on page 187 and 188. While no psychiatrist or mental health counselor is required for a level one service, all program staff are capable of monitoring stabilized mental health problems and recognizing any instability in a patient with a co-occurring mental health condition. When co-occurring mental health or general medical conditions are present, it may require collaboration between credentialed or licensed mental health and addiction professionals. Psychiatric and medical consultations should be available within 24 hours by telephone, or if in person, it has to be within a time frame that's appropriate to the severity and the urgency of the consultation requested. Next slide. So what does co-occurring capability look like? ACM has eliminated specific definitions for addiction-only services within this edition of the ACM criteria. Our old um, version of the ACM text did define addiction-only treatment services, but this version of the text, it has admitted addi omitted addiction-only services, and also it's omitted a definition for mental health-only services, because clearly the expectation is that all of our services should at bare minimum be screening, assessing, and referring if necessary for a co-occurring condition. With the assumption that most people coming through the door are likely to have a co-occurring issue, the program will have everything in place that it needs so that these individuals can be treated with respect, welcomed for care, and not turned away or treated differently. That they're going to be provided with evidence-based integrated care so they can begin their journey in recovery from both mental health and substance use disorder issues. And I think I'm going to turn it over here to Lynn, if I'm not mistaken. Good morning, everyone. Yes, so here um, on slide nine is a chart that comes right from the text on page 30. So we're talking about what co-occurring capable is. And has, as Dottie had indicated, we need to assume that the next person coming in the door has some co-occurring condition. So if you look here, it really is about the interrelationship of addictive behaviors and mental health conditions. So barriers are eliminated based on substance use in a mental health program, and there are no barriers based on the presence of any kind of psychiatric diagnosis or uh, prescri prescribed medication in an SUD program. So go ahead, Kathleen. Okay, so individuals with co-occurring mental health and addiction symptoms are welcome in the program and encouraged to discuss all issues in treatment to get help with managing mental health and addiction issues. So again, it's the interrelationship between the use of substances or other addictive behaviors and mental health symptoms and conditions. And the person with co-occurring needs should be addressed as a routine part of care. Assessment you know, should be happening and it should be a routine part of care. And go on to the next slide. And here's the way, you know, co-occurring conditions and matching needs to services. Oh, excuse me, I just got confused by a pop-up on my screen. But you are going to have patients with um, co-occurring mental health needs of mild to moderate severity, um, and they can be addressed in a co-occurring capable program. And patients with 
more moderate to high severity needs would be referred to a co-occurring enhanced program. And then there's also going to be patients who have uh, are much more complex. Individuals with much more complex uh, issues may have um, legal issues, they may have physical health issues, um, but they are able to succeed in treatment focusing on addressing their substance use conditions um, that may often contribute to mental health symptoms. And then I think we go back to Kathleen. Yes, hi, thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Dottie. Okay, so talking about um, access to care barriers. So you can see here that access to care barriers based on the presence of a psychiatric diagnosis or even prescribed psychiatric medications are eliminated in a co-occurring capable system. And in a mental health service, barriers based on current substance use are also eliminated. Um, so I, I think that, you know, when I was thinking about this slide, I was thinking about what are some of these real life access to care barriers that we experience. And so as I'm kind of going through this, I, I would actually encourage people if you and I have, we haven't done this yet with these TA calls, so just bear with me. But if there are access to care barriers related to an individual's psychiatric um, diagnosis or, or mental health symptoms, even maybe if it's not a formal diagnosis, um, or access to care barriers maybe in a mental health setting uh, related to somebody's substance use disorder. If you know of any of these barriers, if you wouldn't mind putting that in the chat, just typing it in if you feel comfortable, I would be interested and curious to see kind of what individuals um, see on a regular basis. Um, so some of the access to care barriers that I could think of are related to stigma. So this goes obviously in both directions. Substance use or misuse can be stigmatized in psychiatric treatment settings and in addiction treatment settings, mental health concerns can be kind of pushed to the back burner um, or stigmatized. Um, or more importantly, having a mental health condition could be a reason why somebody is maybe not even admitted to treatment. Um, so I'm good, I'm seeing some of these barriers that people are putting into the chat. I see one at least. If, please keep them coming if other folks have any examples of real life barriers, if you can put them in there. Um, the second one that I wanna just kind of bring up is admission criteria, policies and procedures. So an example of this that I could think of is really kind of an admissions list um, of exclusionary conditions. So just kind of stating right off the, right the get-go that we do not accept A, B, C, D, psychiatric conditions or we don't accept ABCD psychiatric medications in our facility um, and on the flip side for mental health facilities uh, you know we don't accept individuals who have a history of substance use disorder or active substance use disorder or if they don't have at least blank amount of time abstinent then you know we're not going to be able to take them and I think MAT is a great example here. So mental health facilities who are saying that they can't accept folks who are on medication assisted treatment if they're on Suboxone or Methadone. Um, so I think these are some of the examples that I could think of. Um, and I'm seeing some additional barriers in the chat. So I'm just gonna take a minute to look at these here. Barriers to mental health outpatient providers accepting intake appointments for an individual based on the report of active and recent SUD and no current SUD treatment engagement. So saying if you're not engaged in treatment, then we're not gonna we're not gonna accept you. That's that's definitely one that we've heard of. The primary barrier in our county is access to care in terms of timelines. Those need psychiatric consult and our treatment are frequently on waiting lists, are not able to be seen for an evaluation for several months. This is due to the limited number of providers. That's a great point. I think everybody is obviously hearing that, especially in light of COVID. Um, you know, the psychiatric shortages um, that we're experiencing. And um, that is absolutely a barrier. So these are really, really great examples. One that I thought of that I didn't put on here was, I'm not sure if people experience insurance barriers, um, you know, related to um, an individual who has a mental health diagnosis or a substance use disorder, getting them into care and then getting that care covered. Um, limited number of providers in Philadelphia County who provide services for co-occurring enhanced services. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, we're gonna be talking a little bit about co-occurring enhanced um, later on in the, in the slide deck um, and just wanna highlight the difference between co-occurring capability and co-occurring enhanced. But I, we're not gonna do that at this time, but that is a really excellent point. So we will speak to that. 
Um, thank you, everybody. Definitely active or recent activity with eating disorders. A great example. Um, these are really, really very helpful. So thank you for putting those in the chat. And if you can think of more, please keep them coming. There are no co-occurring funds at the state level, either SUD or mental health funds. Thank you, Eric. All right, I'm going to go on. I could look at these for a long time. All right, so this next slide here is individuals are routinely screened for co-occurring substance use, addictive behavior, mental health, trauma issues, and the results of screening, inform assessment, and intervention. So I want to break this statement up really into two parts. So in the first part of the sentence, ACM is really talking about the need for mental health programs to be screening for substance use, addictive behaviors, so things like compulsive gambling, um, compulsive sexual behaviors, you know, over exercise, eating, you know, all kinds of different stuff, shopping, we can go on and on about um, addictive behaviors. Um, and they're not screening for just current um, SUD or addictive behaviors, but they're looking for a history and maybe even a family history of behaviors and symptoms. Um, we want to ask about experimentation, um, you know, quote unquote ex experimentation with other substances and any history of overdoses or hospitalizations related um, to substance use, medical issues directly or indirectly related to substance use. Um, and then in substance use disorder treatment settings, we're asking targeted questions related to mental health. So we're inquiring about sleep patterns, history of mental health in the family, mood patterns, energy levels, adverse childhood events, traumas, energy levels, you know, exposure to violence, neglect, unhealthy relationships. I mean, trauma in general, really kind of knowing how to ask those questions. Suicide attempts, obviously, history of self-injurious behavior. I mean, that list obviously goes on and on. And it's really all about kind of learning how to screen effectively for these um, for these things. Um, in the second part of the sentence, ASAM is really talking about the making sure that these screenings inform assessment and intervention. So if the screening flags a possible issue with mental health or substance use disorders, then the clinician is going to go ideally in a much deeper dive and ask more targeted questions in an attempt to identify and maybe make a possible diagnosis. Um, if there is a consent, um, and I think I missed mentioning this in the beginning, if there's a consent uh, for a family member or somebody who knows the individual very well, and you can maybe gather additional information from them about history, that would be something that would be appropriate here. Again, if there's a consent. Um, so we would ask these more targeted questions. We do a little bit of a deeper dive. And then make a possible list of concerns the interdisciplinary team needs to address or refer out for further assessment. So um, our findings from the screening are informing the treatment planning process and the interventions chosen here. All right, and so we just talked about the importance of screening for substance use disorders and mental health issues, and then allowing that information gathered to really inform the assessment and the interventions, the treatment plan, pretty much informing everything about an individual's treatment. Um, this slide really adds to this concept and indicates the importance of noting in the treatment plan any substance use, addictive behaviors, mental health conditions. Um, and so this means that we are working with the patient, we're asking them what they want to work with in terms of their substance use and their addictive behavior and their mental health symptoms or issues. If there's a formal diagnosis, you would note that. We would then use the patient's own words and we would add this to the treatment plan. So even if the individual doesn't see a particular issue or set of symptoms or behaviors as a problem, that's, that's okay. Like we can still put that in the treatment plan. This really signals two things. Number one, that we've screened the patient and that we've identified a, a set of symptoms that need to be looked at more in depth in the treatment plan. And we can indicate how intensely we will look into this. Maybe we will even begin to treat this if we can. Or maybe the patient will be referred outside to a program for additional treatment or guidance. The other thing that this signals is that the interdisciplinary team is comfortable talking openly about mental health and substance use disorder issues. And I think that's really important to note here. This this reminds the patient that if they're in the right place, really nothing is off limits and they are in capable hands. The people who are treating them are not fearful of, of you know, their symptoms. They are, they are skilled and capable of talking about it and beginning to treat it. Again, co-occurring capable programs do not shy away from having open and honest dialogues about both mental health and substance use disorders or addictive behaviors. They are skilled and trained at having these conversations around difficult issues. And many of them are working towards being able to actually treat, to some extent, both mental health and substance use disorder issues. 
So I just mentioned that even if the services are not available on site, the referral or coordination should be noted in the treatment plan. And I'm going to turn it over to Dottie to talk more about the importance of developing these relationships and partnerships with providers um, who can fill in the gaps and ensure that individuals with mental health and substance use disorders or addictive behaviors can begin to receive the treatment they need for all the conditions that they're experiencing. Turning it over to Dottie now. Daddy, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Kathleen. Sorry about that. Um, when we're talking about co-occurring capable programs, we want to just highlight for everybody that both mental health and addiction um, co-occurring capable programs should have consultation routinely available to the treatment team. The program is going to have partnerships with prescribers of psychotropic medications if they don't have that ability on staff. And, and we want to make sure that there's communication between the treatment team and these prescribers. In the mental health system, there are partnerships with addiction treatment providers for consultation and coordination addiction services, including pharmacological therapies. So it's important to remember that regardless of the type of program, whether you're an addiction treatment service or a mental health program, co-occurring capability can be achieved through existing program resources. It's not so much about having a psychiatrist on your team or hiring a mental health professional per se. It is about designing all aspects of your program, making sure that all of your staff are competent and be, to be able to treat people and not diagnoses, to be able to recognize signs and symptoms, to look for um, general medical issues, whether or not the individual has experienced trauma. Um, you're going to do these things through the routine course of treatment. If you don't find them, great, your job just got easier. But if you do, we're, we've shifted to the place where we are now treating people and not diagnoses. Next slide, Kathleen. So again, similarly, we want to make sure that we're providing ongoing education to individuals about the medications that they're being prescribed. And there's a special shout out here to a realization that while all of us do this initially, when we um, initially prescribe the meds, um, we need to give them information. We may need to repeat that information. We may, may need to go back in and make sure that people understand the meds they're being given, why they're being given that medication, that they know and are taking them as prescribed at the appropriate dose. So we may need to repeat those conversations over time. We may need to include family members in those conversations, depending on the individual's condition, their level of receptiveness to that medication, whether or not they're experiencing any cognitive difficulties. And for those of you who may have been on these this TA call a couple months back, Kathleen did a, a training on um, the therapies that are um, highly recommended within the ACM criteria. And, and so I will highlight that all levels of care talk about the therapies that should be provided and medication management is one of them, regardless of the level of care. So you can turn to the therapy section of that level of care and it will give you much clearer guidance and recommendations about um, your med medication prescribing practices. And then I think we're turning it over to Lynn again. Okay, so next slide, Kathleen. Okay, so treatment plans include specific interventions to help patients manage their addiction and mental health symptoms. Individuals with moderate to severe needs should be provided with person-centered services. As Dottie had indicated, you're treating a person, not a diagnosis. Individuals may have some ongoing symptoms, but this may be their baseline. This population can succeed in focusing on addressing their substance use conditions that often, again, inter, uh, relate and contribute to their mental health symptoms. Okay, slide 18. Group programming routinely includes education about substance use and addiction, as well as mental health symptoms and mental illnesses. Individuals may discuss impulsive drinking when depressed or that they end up depressed after drinking, for example. Group participants are better able to support one another in progressing toward their individual goals 
when they are able to share and seek support of the interrelationship between co-occurring conditions. Okay, next slide. And all staff, including addiction counselors, nurses, mental health clinicians, and residential aides are supported and assisted to be co-occurring competent so that all staff work as an integrated team to help patients with multiple issues make progress toward their goals. So you'll see you know, various trainings and, and that kind of thing offered to staff in order to keep that co-occurring competence. And I believe we go back to Kathleen now. All right, thank you, Lynn. Okay, so at this point in the presentation, we will be reviewing questions that we've received from providers related, not just providers, but other stakeholders as well, related to the topic of co-occurring capability. Um, I want to thank the providers who took the time to submit these questions to the ACMRA account leading up to this presentation. And I want to remind folks that if these questions kind of complicate the things for you or these, you know, questions and answers complicate things for you or they lead to more questions, you know, please feel free to put those in the chat or you can put those um, to our RA ACM account and we would be happy to kind of respond to those. But I would just remind you to put your email address in the box if you're going to be putting a question in there as well. All right, so I think Dottie is going to be taking the first question here. Oh, Dottie, I believe you're on mute again. Maybe that's not a good idea. So thanks, Kathleen. So um, the question is a little bit tricky from my perspective. It was what kind of training is recommended so that staff can be considered co-occurring competent. And the list you see in front of you is a list of trainings that previously were strongly encouraged by the state for us to participate in as providers. These trainings were all created and developed by Drexel University. And it goes back to uh, the early 2000s when our first co-occurring um, capable bulletin came out in 2006, and we were providing these trainings all across the state. Um, these trainings are not mandatory trainings, and they are no longer being required. Um, so what the because it is in flux, because we don't have a clear um, direction, Yet the state is working very diligent to diligently to create a new co-occurring capable and enhanced bulletin for us and new training guidelines and expectations might be um, given to us there. We're, we're in the middle of a process here and I can't give you concrete trainings that you must participate in to be considered co-occurring competent. I would encourage you to use this list as a nice guideline. And I would also encourage you to look at the therapy section of your ACM criteria text again and make sure you're adherent with what the textbook says. So if it says you should be using motivational interviewing approach, approaches, then MI training would be important. If it says that you should be offering uh, medication management, then maybe courses in psychopharma are very appropriate for your staff. Um, I know the criteria talks a lot about engaging family members in recovery and working with family members beyond just strictly family education. So maybe this training and working respectfully with family members would be an important addition for your team. I think you need to use the, um, the text and the resources that the department has available for you on their website to determine where you are adherent to the criteria and way, where you may need to strengthen staff skills um, and be patient and wait for the state to come out with their updated bulletin. Okay. Our co-occurring competent SCD programs expected to admit individuals <laughs> with severe mental health conditions. Let's take a look at what the ACM text states. The typical co-occurring capable addiction treatment program at any level of care will be able to manage a small percentage of individuals who have more serious psychiatric conditions. These are patients who are interested in receiving addiction treatment and with support are capable of succeeding in the addiction treatment program. And I just want to reference you back to um, the chart on slide 11, which is in page, on page 30 of the text. The same is likely true for managing individuals who may intermittently have flare-ups of acute symptoms like flashbacks or panic attacks, but they do not need acute mental health treatment at this time. So, you know, simply stated, that's yes. Okay. 
What is the difference between co-occurring capable and co-occurring enhanced? Co-occurring capable screen, assess, and refer for treatment. Enhanced programs provide fully integrated treatment. So basically that would be the difference between uh, you know, referring someone, providing a screening, consulting with someone and referring or provided integrated care where both issues, um, unstable addiction and mental health issues can be adequately addressed by the program. DHS and DDAP will be publishing, as Dottie indicated, an updated co-occurring bulletin explaining specific programmatic and licensing requirements necessary, but at this point, uh, definitely refer to your text. All right, I believe this is mine. Thanks, Lynn. Okay, so what are programs expected? When are programs expected to be co occurring capable? And so I'm going to just make sure I'm going to mute something here. Okay, there we go. Um, when are programs expected to be co occurring capable? So um, all providers basically receiving funding for providing treatment services under agreements with uh, single county authorities and MCOs must be providing services that are co-occurring capable or actively working towards co-occurring capability. So I would say for anybody who's kind of panicking right now, I would I would just you know I would just remind folks that these are really things that can be added within existing program resources. So, you know, that's really the purpose of this presentation today is to kind of go through the different elements. You know, what does a program really need to be working towards to be considered co-occurring capable? I it, I would imagine many programs are already there, um, but for those programs who are maybe missing a few of these elements, you know, we just ask that you're working in this direction. You really are actively working in the direction of co-occurring capability. Um, and, uh, you know, we are available for technical assistance. You know, we would encourage folks to reach out to the RA ASAM account if they're really struggling with one of the elements that we spoke about today. But I just want to be really clear that programs are, they should either be co-occurring capable at this time, like right now, or they should be actively working towards co-occurring capability. Um, and I just want to, I just want to, you know, kind of note here that in page 24 of the ASAM criteria, it really talks about the elimination of a specific definition for addiction only services within this edition, so the third edition's ACM criteria. Um, the editors of that recent version, the third edition, also omitted providing a specific definition for mental health only services, since mental health programs should be also capable of assessing and treating co occurring conditions. So the way that the ACM criteria is written, it really does kind of, it, it fully embraces this idea that co occurring capability is. Uh, is available at every level of care by every program. All right, turning it over to Dottie for this one. Thank you. So one of the questions we received was about the certified co-occurring disorder professional credential. For those of you that may hold the credential, you'll recognize we have two. We had two in the state of Pennsylvania. We had a CCDP which was a bachelor level credential, and we had the CCDPD diplomate credential. So they were um, created by the Pennsylvania Certification Board back in the early 2000s as a way of us um, supporting our field to move towards co-occurring competency and to have a way for individuals seeking treatment who had these coexisting conditions to have some confidence that the individual that they were working with was educated and informed and knew how to work with individuals who had these very complicated intersecting coexisting conditions. So the PCB created the CCDP and the CCDPD. Um, in early 2008, the CCDP credential was adopted by the International Certification and Reciprocity Consortium, and it became an international credential. So the CCDP became uh, more popular. We had over a thousand people credentialed in the state of Pennsylvania as CCDPs. Um, but credentials are routinely reviewed by the PCB and by the IC and RC. They aren't just standalone documents that sit there in perpetuity. And in 2016, when they were doing their routine review of the CCDB credential, they recognized that because our field has grown so much, because most of the criteria set forth in the CCDP credential was already included as an expert expectation in the CAADC credential, those two credentials were combined in 2016. 
Um, so the CADC was combined um, with the CCDP in 2018. So there today is no longer a freestanding CCDP credential in the state of Pennsylvania. You can't apply to become a certified co-occurring disorder professional um, because all of the standards that were in that credential have been incorporated and encompassed as a routine part of the CAADC and CADC credentials. So currently, the CAADC now requires all clinicians to screen for and assess for co-occurring conditions. Master's level clinicians can identify and diagnose, and the bachelor's level clinicians are expected to identify and refer for treatment if necessary. If the conditions that they identify are do not meet the threshold of a diagnosis, maybe my client is depressed, but their depression is secondary to their substance use disorder and doesn't meet criteria for a full-blown major depressive disorder, then we would continue to treat them in our drug and alcohol treatment program as a symptom of their addictive disease. Thanks, Dottie. Okay, next question here. Can providers qualify for a co-occurring disorders slash capable rate prior to establishing a 3.7 program? So I will admit I got some help from some other folks at DDAP in answering this question, people who are more familiar with the contracting process and XYZ package. But in terms of the process to request a rate, a provider would need to complete an XYZ package and submit this to their home SDA for the rate. Um, providers should reach out to their MCO for the process on how to obtain a health choices rate. And in terms of establishing a rate prior to establishing the program, they would need to identify in the XYZ package budgeted revenues and expenditures, including staff positions. So there's a degree of planning that needs to go into this and explanation. And as the provider works with DDAP to become an aligned 3.7 program, they should reach out to their home SEA to coordinate the timing of submitting an XYZ package. I want to take a moment here just to, um, I would say, put a plug into um, ACM level 3.7 program. So I think most people know that if you are a provider who is interested in providing services um, or to be identified as a level 3.7 provider, um, then the process would be reaching out to the RA ACM email account to um, let us know also about your desire to become aligned as a 3.7 provider. And we can, we can kind of work with you actively on that process and get you from point A to point B. So again, please don't hesitate to reach out to the RA ASAM email account for um, guidance on how to move forward with alignment for 3.7. Okay, and where does the requirement to have a mental health license become a factor in either rate establishment or level of care? So all providers are expected to be co-occurring capable. I just discussed this. So, you, you know, we providers should either be there at this point, they should be co-occurring capable at this time, kind of based on what we've talked about today and the elements we've talked about today, or they should really be actively working towards co-occurring capability. And the additional mental health license, so if you're a substance use disorder, a licensed substance use disorder provider, that additional mental health license from DHS is required in the XYZ package when the provider is asking for a higher co-occurring enhanced rate. So I want to make it very clear, a co-occurring enhanced rate. There is not a rate for co-occurring um, capability. We are talking about the co-occurring enhanced rate. So that additional mental health license from DHS is required when requesting a higher co-occurring enhanced rate. And um, as mentioned in the previous slide, the additional mental health license from DHS is again required for this higher co-occurring enhanced rate. And like Lynn just mentioned, um, DDAP and DHS are currently jointly working on an update to the 2006 Co-Occurring Disorders Competency Bulletin. Um, so this bulletin will address the framework for facilities in the Commonwealth licensed by DDAP and OMSAS who would like to be identified as co-occurring enhanced. Um, and the program must also be properly credentialed with um, the Behavioral Health Managed Care Organizations or BIMCOs to receive an increased rate for providing co-occurring enhanced treatment services each FIMCO obviously has its own process for credentialing, and you'll hear more about what will be required from them as we, DDAP and DHS, continue to work on this bulletin that both Lynn and Dottie mentioned. So just want to reassure everybody that our teams are actively working on this bulletin um, at this time. If you have questions about this, please don't hesitate to reach out to the RAASAM email account. All right, so that is um, the end of our slides. And I just want to 
I want to first of all say thank you so much to Dadi Farr and Lynn Wright for presenting with me today. Um, really, really happy to be working with both of you on this important topic. And and I just want to mention that um, you know Lynn and Dadi are um, part of very an, very integral part of this uh, co-occurring bulletin process that's happening right now with DDAP and DHS. So. Um, hence the reason why I asked them to be involved um, today, and I would consider them very close to being experts on this topic. And um, reminder is that we do not have a topic for our next call, um, which is March 7th, uh, Monday. We are we have a couple of ideas in mind, but we're just solidifying those. So again, if you have any recommendations or suggestions, please type those in the chat box or send those to the ACM email account. We would appreciate that. Um, I will announce the topic um, like I did this time when we have firmed that up. So I'll announce that via email to the folks who are on our um, who are who are attending the training. I'll send it to that list of individuals. So you will get information about that topic via an email. So keep your eyes open for that. Um, I also just want to point out the ACM transition page right here. Again, we encourage people to look at this page. This page is currently being updated and it's being updated on a regular basis. Um, and I also just want to put, um, I want to, this is very exciting news that just kind of came out last week is that um, effective February 1st, DDAP has expanded its approved curriculum um, for ACM training to include an additional online training through the American Society of Addiction Medicine. So this increases our total number of approved online ACM trainings um, and there's information about that training, that additional training on the DDAP ACM transition website. So really great news on that. And um, last thing I'll say is if you have questions or if you have suggestions or if you need technical assistance, please don't hesitate to reach out to the ACM email account noted here. And I know that a lot of individuals put in the chat, they were asking for our slides. Um, and I, we will be posting the slides to the website. So after, for those of you who are kind of new to these calls, after every of these trainings, we post the slides to the website along with the recording of the training and the questions and answers that we got during the training. Um, we just ask that folks give us a little bit of time to get those on the website, but I want to reassure you that they will be on there for public viewing. Um, and I think that that is everything that I needed to so it's uh, 1053 according to my watch. We have about seven minutes left. I'm going to leave this meeting open uh, for folks to continue to put uh, questions in the chat. And I just want to reassure everybody who did put questions in the chat that we are recording those and we will be getting back to you as long as you provided your email address. Um, so again, thank you to Dottie and Lynn and, and everybody have a great rest of the week. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks, everybody.